Right guys, Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1, 12 to 17. Habakkuk is struggling then with this perennial problem for people of faith. You've got our faith. We're prepared to be faithful people. We're prepared to say, yeah, I believe, I believe. But then, the rubber hits the road. And you've got an appearance in a fallen world of the situation being like this, but then we're told by our God that actually in heaven and eternity and so on it's like this. And you've got to hold the two together. And that's what faith is. It's holding together the appearance of the world in which we live and the eternal realities of things that are actually true and trusting God with that. Trusting God with that difference. So frequently, we've said this a number of times before. Christian character, the character of the person of faith, is formed between the hammer and the anvil. And so often it's the hammer of our current experience in a fallen world, but the anvil of God's truth and his word, and what is actually true in eternity. And that's where it happens. Now Habakkuk is faced with that conflict at this point in time. He's being hammered on the anvil. And he's actually got to the point of actually challenging God. And that's where he starts in this book, in chapter 1. He's challenged God because it seemed that God was doing nothing about the godlessness of the people of Habakkuk's place and time. And Habakkuk said to God, why are you doing nothing about these people? And God said, you think I'm doing nothing? Behind the scenes where you don't see, I'm doing a lot. God has responded to Habakkuk's two questions, his twin questions, why and how long, with a very clear indication that God has not been inactive, that he's got it all in hand, and more than Habakkuk wants to see happen, is about to happen, is very close to happening, because God has known far above and beyond all that Habakkuk has ever known, all along. The monarchy, the Jewish monarchy will go, and the nation state will go. And in the outworking of the great plan and purpose of God, that terrible seeming thing is going to prepare the way, the way of the Messiah and the kingdom, no longer of kings, men kings, but the kingdom of God. So the unified monarchy, which they all looked to and thought, oh marvellous, the day to day, looking backwards, hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. God said at the beginning of setting apart human kings for Israel, that isn't going to work. But they're insistent and they wanted it. And they, he said, God, I'm going to give it to you and this is what's going to happen. And it has just happened. And it's against that just happening that Habakkuk is crying out. And God is now saying, okay, we're going to go back to plan A, which was my plan all along, which was going to happen all along because he was going to have to. I'm going to wipe out these kingdoms of men, all these daft things he thought he wanted, and I'm going to bring the Messiah, the King, and the Kingdom of God. Mercy for sin, pardon for sin, and a peace that endures. Habakkuk didn't know all that yet. So in the mix of all of that, Habakkuk has just heard what's going to happen, and he's going, ah, ah, now! It's a huge bombshell. And that's why he's complaining here in these verses in uh, chapter 1, uh, 12 to 17. Huge bombshell. Not least because of the suddenness and thoroughness of it all, which is a bit ironic given Habakkuk's first complaint. He was, he was saying, why have you done something? God said, I'm doing this. And he was oh, too much. And God said, you know, he said to God, how long? God said, now. And that's too much for Habakkuk as well. But, but Habakkuk mixes all that up because he, he can't bear to think of the wickedness and of the idolatry of the people who are going to be God's instruments in all this. God is choosing to use people that Habakkuk would not have had used. And we've got to be prepared for that with our God as well. Because he's a little bit more radical than the rest of us.